Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello and welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's podcast. Today we are excited to host a discussion on Michael F. Cannon and Jeffrey A. Singer's white paper, Drug Reformation and Government's Power to Require Prescriptions. First, our moderator, Christina Sandifer, is the Executive Vice President at the Goldwater Institute. She develops policies and litigates cases advancing healthcare freedom, free enterprise, private property rights, free speech, and taxpayer rights. Christina is a co-drafter of the Right to Try Initiative, now federal law, which protects terminally ill patients' right to try safe investigational treatments that have been prescribed by their physician, but are not yet FDA approved. She has won important victories for property rights in Arizona and works nationally to promote the Institute's Private Property Rights Protection Act, a state level reform that requires government to pay owners when regulations destroy property rights and reduce property values. Christina is a graduate of Michigan State University College of Law and Hillsdale College. Michael F. Cannon is Cato Institute's Director of Health Policy Studies. Cannon is an influential healthcare wonk, Washington Post says, Obamacare's single most relentless antagonist from the New Republic, Obamacare's fiercest credit critic, uh, says The Week, the intellectual father of King versus Burwell, says Modern Healthcare, and the most famous libertarian healthcare scholar, Washington Examiner says. Washingtonian Magazine named Cannon one of Washington D.C.'s most influential people in both 2021 and 2022. Cannon holds an M.A. in economics and a J.M. in law and economics from George Mason University and a B.A. in American government from the University of Virginia. He is a member of the Board of Advisors of Harvard Health Policy Review and the Federal Society Regulatory Transparency Projects, FDA and Health Working Group. Christina, over to you. All right. Well, thank you. And today we're going to talk about government's power to require prescriptions for medications. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic because, Michael, I was thinking this is probably the healthcare topic that most affects every single American. I think everybody has had some kind of encounter, some kind of story uh, about trying to obtain prescription medication. And I think we all probably have some frustrations with this system as well. Um, but I'm not really sure that many people understand, you know, why certain medicines require a lengthy visit to the doctor rather than just running down to the pharmacy and uh, picking up a drug. And I also think that people probably don't understand that it wasn't always that way. And it wasn't always the case that the law required people to get a prescription before uh, they were able to get medicine. So let's start by just talking about that briefly. When did the government start requiring prescriptions for drugs and why? So this is a really interesting story. And, you know, thank you uh, 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 for uh, agreeing to do this podcast and talk about our paper. Uh, the it, You're right. It wasn't always the case that the government imposed prescription requirements. There were prescription requirements before that. Uh, ma drug manufacturers uh, would offer some drugs to patients over the counter, and others for others they would require patients to go to a doctor uh, or some other uh, clinician in order to p purchase certain drugs because they were w more dangerous and uh, and required some medical expertise to use. It it came about. Uh, or, or the uh, the the existence of government imposed prescription requirements came about almost by accident. Uh, it was back in the early 1900s that Congress passed the uh, Pure Food and Drugs Act, and uh, at the time uh, when Congress was. Uh, uh, deliberating about this law, uh, there are a lot of people who said that, hey, wait a second, uh, or I, maybe I should back up. There was a, uh, a tragedy called the elixir sulfonilamide tragedy that led to 105 people dying uh, from, uh, uh, from the elixir sulfonilamide. It was uh, not because of the active ingredient in the drug, but because of the solvent that the manufacturer used. And as a result, Congress uh, passed legislation to require drug manufacturers to get government approval before uh, they could market a drug. They had to prove to the government that the drug was safe. And 
uh, this was a really uh, and and there was there was debate over whether this would take away the right to self medicate. Uh, and proponents of the legislation said that no, it will not lead to. Uh, government taking away the right to self-medicate. It will not lead to government opposed prescription requirements. But as a result, one of the, the, one of the unintended consequences of the law is that it did. Uh, because the law imposed some really stiff labeling requirements on uh, products that, sh- that, uh, that drug manufacturers wanted to sell to, directly to consumers over the counter, but exempted drugs from those labeling requirements if the Manufacturer marketed them to only to uh, physicians, uh, uh, or, or or marketed them only by prescription. Uh, the law, despite the author's assurances that it would not lead to government-imposed prescription requirements, uh, it ended up doing exactly that. And the FDA then claimed the power to require prescriptions uh, for certain drugs, and the uh, Congress then ratified that about forty uh, years later when it passed the. Uh, uh, the Durham Humphrey amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and uh, this was sort of this is really ironic because the the tragedy that led to uh, to uh, the creation of government imposed prescrip- prescription requirements was the elixir sulfonilamide tragedy, and as I said, more than a hundred people died from uh, that uh, from that medication, but. Uh, including 34 children, but the vast majority of them got it from a doctor. They were taking that medication under a doctor's prescription. The doctors were uh, not being careful enough about the drug that they were giving to these patients. And as a result, 105 uh, uh, patients died. I think it was 95% or 95 of them uh, uh, took it under a doctor's direction. So not only... Uh, did Congress um, uh, did sort of the Congress inadvertently create this power? The FDA seized it without uh, explicit congressional authorization. But it was a really uh, uh, it it it, it, w- it is a power that would not have prevented the sort of tragedy that gave rise to the uh, the legislation that uh, uh, that ended up creating it, and uh, that true. In that tragedy, you can see why this government power uh, or why giving government this power really does not make patients any safer. Yeah, you know, it seems like the history of uh, drug regulation, federal drug regulation follows that kind of pattern. You have some sort of tragedy and then what comes out of it is a regulation that seems to kind of take advantage of the tragedy, but doesn't actually address it or wouldn't have prevented it. Um, But, you, you know, when the FDA was first formed, it, we were living in a time when people probably didn't have access to the kinds of information that they do today about treatments. And I think a big charge of the FDA at that time was just to, like you said, labeling, right, to make sure that people understood what it is that they were taking, what was in the the drugs and medications they were purchasing. So isn't that you know a good justification for a government prescription requirement because your average person, even though your average person today might have a lot more information about a medicine, you know, I don't have a medical degree, so I have no idea how a particular medicine might work for me or whether it might interact with other drugs that I'm taking. So isn't isn't it a good thing that government wants to require people to go consult with a medical expert before they take medications? You know, on the on the surface, that seems eminently reasonable. Uh, Unfortunately, there are two, at least two factors um, that come into play that actually make patients less safe. Uh, one of them is that when the FDA said to manufacturers that uh, you can either uh, market your drugs directly to consumers, and then you have to include all of this information that we're requ- requiring you to include, uh, which is very costly, uh, uh, putting all that information on a drug's label, and then keeping up with uh, the uh, changes in those requirements. Or uh, we can make it a lot simpler. You can market the drugs directly to physicians. Um, uh, what that did was not only gave the FDA the power, in effect, to require prescriptions and encourage uh, a lot of 
manufacturers to switch drugs from over-the-counter status to prescription status in order to avoid that regulatory burden. Uh, it also meant that consumers were getting less information from the manufacturers about those drugs. Uh, the, the law prevented manufacturers from, from uh, marketing those label or, or marketing those drugs to consumers uh, with information that was intelligible to consumers. They wanted it to be intelligible only to physicians, and so uh, he, here you have uh, the the law of unintended consequences coming into effect, where uh, a, a regulation that was supposed to uh, give consumers more information by requiring them to go consult with a physician, inadvertently left them with less information and left them uh, more ignorant about how drugs work. Uh, the second factor is, as the elixir sulfonylamide uh, tragedy suggests, when you require consumers to go see a physician, that, that doesn't mean that all is well. That doesn't mean that everything is going to go well. Uh, oftentimes, physicians are not very careful about the prescriptions that they issue. Uh, there's not only the elixir sulfonylamide tragedy that suggests this, there's other economic research that shows that uh, physicians uh, prescribe more potent drugs than consumers would choose for themselves. And because consumers, when like you, Christina, are uh, aware of their own ignorance, and this is their own body that they're talking about, and uh, that we're talking about here, that's at risk. And so they generally are more conservative in their drug consumption when they are the ones making the decisions, and less conservative, more risk seeking uh, when they go to uh, when they consult with a physician because they have a physician's blessing uh, on uh, whatever drugs they consume. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Michael, because, you know, think about, I think about when I do research, you know, I want to, my Keurig broke and I needed to update it. And I must have spent 45 minutes on the internet reading reviews about different replacements, right? And, and, but then when I go to a doctor and I'm sick and I need a prescription, I think a lot of times we just, we don't go home and Google the drug. I mean, maybe sometimes you do, but typically I think your doctor just says, well, you have X and you need Y and here you go. And I always spend a lot more time doing research on electronics or where to have dinner than, um, than we do on, on what drugs we're putting in our bodies. Yeah, that's, that's weird. And it's a little scary and, and, you know, studying health, study health policy long enough and you'll listen to what the doctor says, but then you'll also want to go do some Googling because you're aware of, of dynamics like this. And, you know, I'll give you two, uh, uh, two examples. One, one kind of, um, pedestrian and one really tragic of, of this dynamic. One is uh, a study that was done of women in Seattle uh, who took, uh, uh, who self-evaluated for whether they were, um, for whether oral contraceptives were appropriate for them. So they got some information about oral contraceptives and they filled out a questionnaire and then they made the decision for themselves about uh, whether they would uh, begin taking the pill. Uh, but then the same women's uh, profiles were shown to physicians, uh, and uh, the study, uh, uh, the researchers conducting this study ga gathered those physicians' views about whether the pill would be appropriate for these women or whether they would prescribe it for them. And it turned out that the women were, uh, were more conservative in their decisions. They took greater account of the risks of oral contraceptives and were less likely to uh, choose to take the pill than the physicians were to prescribe it for them. So there's another piece of evidence that consumers are generally more conservative about their drug consumption when they are the ones making the decision without a, uh, without a clinician uh, prescribing drugs to them. But also the, the, the other big tragedy, uh, drug tragedy in the United States and actually worldwide that led Congress to give the FDA more power was thalidomide. This was a sedative and anti-emetic that, uh, that uh, physicians were prescribing to, uh, to lots of people, but also pregnant women. Uh, and it helped with morning sickness. Uh, unfortunately, it also led to severe birth defects and death among, uh, uh, among uh, fetuses and, uh, and infants. And in the United States, uh, every single woman who took uh, uh, thalidomide did it under the uh, uh, under a physician's prescription because it w was not available over the counter, and the physicians did not ask enough questions about you know 
was this being, uh, has this been studied in pregnant women? Uh, are you studying this in pregnant women? What are the effects on the mother and the fetus and these sorts of things? Uh, again, uh, this was, uh, uh, as you mentioned, this is another example of the, uh, the sort of, uh, cycle of how the FDA accumulates power. Uh, there is a drug tragedy uh, that um, Congress and then Congress responded to it by giving the FDA powers that would not have prevented that tragedy. Uh, but it is another example of how going just because you're going to a physician that doesn't doesn't mean that your drug consumption is going to be safe. In many cases, it can be riskier. Yeah, you know that that makes a lot of sense. And actually, I think. Um, I think the reason we don't that it first isn't intuitive to us is because we're we're talking about two different questions here. There's there's like the question of the information and and the science behind the particular treatment, and you know obviously that will come from the manufacturer and the doctor and whatever else. But then there's your individual risk tolerance, right? So do I think that the benefits of taking a particular drug when they're described to me will outweigh the, the potential risks? And I think that's something to your point, Michael, that, you know, a patient may be more or less risk averse. That's, that's an individual question. That's not really a scientific or medical question. That's more of just an individual preference question that, that might get sort of overridden if, um, if we're not doing that independent analysis. Um, so other reasons though, I mean, you're, this makes a lot of sense about the safety discussion, but you know, I, in my work as, as well as you and yours, I've tried to remove some, what I see as needless barriers to people's ability to, uh, take the medicines that they, um, that they want. And when you try to do that, a lot of times you hear people say, well, if you don't have a prescription requirement, e even if it would be safe or safe enough for somebody to take this drug over the counter. If you don't have a requirement for a prescription, then you're going to discourage people or, or not encourage people um, to go to doctors regularly. So you hear this sometimes um, for women's well visits to the gynecologist and they'll say, well, you know, the reason that we want birth control to require a prescription is because we want women to get regular checkups to make sure that, you know, they don't have cancer or something else going on. And if you just let them go get birth control at the pharmacy, they're, they're not going to see their doctors. Um, same thing with even, even I, you know, contacts, right? Uh, people, they say, well, if, if you could just go get your contacts uh, without having to go to an eye doctor, well, then you're not going to go get an eye exam. Um, and someone might not notice that you've got macular degeneration or something like that. So, you know, what are, what are your responses to that reason behind requiring prescriptions for particular drugs? Well, if that rationale makes sense, why not require prescriptions for Band-Aids and Q-tips and aspirin or, and anything just to get people into the doctor's office so they, they can get you know a battery of, of tests? Uh, those tests, uh, those services that doctors provide should stand or fall on their own. They should be able to if if those services, uh, those those tests that they want to administer to patients, uh, are economically justifiable, that means that the health benefits are so great that they justify the cost. They should be able to sell those on their own without having to, you know, trap patients in their offices by requiring them to come there in order to get a prescription for the pill. And um, and and if you. Uh, I don't think that there's a safety rationale for um, for you know uh, using prescription government imposed prescription requirements in this way to serve some other uh, 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 some other health need. Uh, other uh, those as I say, those other health needs should stand and fall on their own. And and here's here's a, a point that I I think we really should uh, emphasize is that all of the research that has been done on the whether government imposed prescription requirements make patients more or less safe finds that it, they those giving government that power makes patients less safe. You know, poisoning deaths increased after uh, af the, a, after the FDA assumed this power. When you compare other countries to the United States uh, or, or countries that impose prescription requirements versus those that don't, uh, that you don't get. Um, uh, more health uh, patients are not safer in the countries that impose those requirements, and that is 
true even of medications that have externalities like antibiotics. Imposing prescriptions for antibiotics does not appear to make patients less safe than uh, than having government not impose those prescriptions. Yeah, you know, and and it's interesting because when you're talking about forcing somebody to go to the doctor in order to get a prescription for their own well-being, I think oftentimes people forget that there is another choice, right? Sometimes people will just forego treatment altogether because they can't afford the doctor or they can't afford to take the time uh, off of work to go see the doctor or whatever else. Um, And the one that always kind of comes to mind for me on that is strep throat. So you mentioned other countries. I think that's another thing, unless you've traveled a lot, um, people are probably unaware that there are countries that we would consider less free than the United States that actually don't have these stringent government required um, prescriptions. And strep throat just always, you know, there's, I know there's many other countries that don't require you to go to a doctor to get a prescription before you can get treated with an antibiotic for strep throat. And it seems to me like something that, you know, is extremely painful. It's extremely uh, dangerous if you don't treat it. It can lead to very serious health consequences. And yet it's very easy to diagnose, right? There's a test for it, very easy to diagnose. And we have treatments readily available, whether it's what penicillin or amoxicillin or you know, easy to get treatments. So you have other countries, you have even the Veterans Administration that allows people to just go to a pharmacy and take a test. And if they have strep, get treated. Um, Whereas here in the United States, you know, I I think because it requires a doctor's visit, there's probably a lot of people who don't actually get treated for strep throat or don't get treated early enough and then suffer more severe consequences. Uh, That can uh, be the case. Um, uh, And you can... um I was going to draw a a parallel to uh, other... um Barriers that the FDA puts in the way of diagnostic tests and treatments, uh, and um, uh, aside from um, prescription requirements, uh, the pre-market approval requirements that exist for diagnostic tests and drugs and devices, uh, those might make the um, the products that make it to markets uh, safer and higher quality. Uh, by weeding out uh, or blocking from the market some low quality products, but the those requirements come at the cost of delaying access to those products and uh, and suppressing uh, the development of of other beneficial products so much that on balance, what all the research suggests is that the FDA is regulating in the in the realm uh, uh, in in. Uh, uh, to an extent that uh, it is causing more harm, uh, at least at the margin, than it is preventing. And I think that uh, when we look at prescription requirements, it's the same story that we've been telling when it comes to uh, uh, the safety standard uh, that the FDA imposes, the efficacy standard the FDA imposes uh, on uh, entry into the market for pharmaceuticals, for example, that yes, in theory, you could be uh, saving some lives uh, by preventing some harmful consumption, but when you look at not just those the reduction in type one errors, but the much greater increase in type two errors, we see that uh, patients are less safe, not more safe. Yeah, and you know when we talk about um, reforming some of these systems, especially for treatments like strep throat or or other medicines that you know that we think are very uh, important for a broad uh, sector of the population to have access to. I think some of us that are kind of familiar with this issue are familiar with uh, efforts to deregulate. We assume, well, it's probably folks on the left uh, who are in favor of these types of regulations, and it's probably folks who are more libertarian leaning or on the right that are against them. Um, but you know, there are, that's not always the case. And I'm thinking specifically here of the birth control pill, which, which we've alluded to a little bit, but, you know, there are so many, I don't know, dozens, hundreds, you probably know the number of countries that don't require a prescription for birth control. Um, we do require that here in the United States. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, this is a, a, a drug where even many of the doctors who, 
who's, who would want to encourage people to come see them, right? Who would want to, to hold the prescription hostage, as they say, to get people to see them and to pay them. Most OBGYNs seem to be in favor of making birth control um, available without a prescription. And yet it doesn't seem, we've seen some reform, but we don't seem to be able to get that done in the United States. And I, I don't think it's, it's quite so simple as well, you know, the, the right wants it and the left doesn't or, or something like that. So can you kind of like break down what exactly is going on with birth control specifically and how politics might play into that? Right. So thank you for raising this issue because this is absolutely a fascinating illustration of how the giving government this power uh, ends up not serving uh, patients. Uh, and it also illustrates the really interesting political dynamics behind uh, the how government uses this power and also, you know, just politics in the United States generally. It's a fascinating window. Uh, and there are multiple types of birth control uh, that I think we should talk about. There's the pill, which we've already mentioned. There's also a uh, plan B emergency contraception, which is the, the morning after pill. But let's start with uh, the pill. It's been around, uh, you know, uh, daily use oral contraceptives have been, they've been around longer. They've been around for 60 years. Uh, when the FDA approved uh, the first pill, women are very familiar with uh, this product. And as you say, it is available without prescription in 100 countries around the world. Uh, there, uh, in 100 countries around the world, women are freer than they are in the United States to buy oral contraceptives because they don't have to get permission from a government a, a appointed gatekeeper. They don't have some uh, government gatekeeper standing between them and the, the medication that they want. And uh, the politics, and so this is this is really absurd. I mean, we've we've mentioned uh, already that uh, women tend to be more careful when they're making the decision for themselves about whether to use the pill than if a physician is making that decision for them. And so there's there's just no reason to keep this drug uh, on uh, 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 it, to give it prescription only status. Uh, the uh, the as I say, it's been around for 60 years, available for uh, uh, without a prescription in more than 100 countries. And there is there is political support for moving it to over-the-counter status uh, it, in both political parties. At least they say, uh, bo both political parties say that that's what they want. There are uh, two leading bills in Congress, one Republican, one Democratic, uh, that uh, say that we're going to promote over-the-counter use to daily use oral contraceptives, over-the-counter access uh, to these drugs. And uh, But if you look at both of the bills, you'll find they don't do anything of the sort. In both cases, what the Democratic legislation and the Republican legislation do is they say to the FDA, please give this expedited consideration. You know, Congress could move this product to over-the-counter status Tomorrow, Congress could repeal the FDA tomorrow and with it, all of these re requirements. But rather than legislate, what, both, what members of both parties are doing is they're deferring to the FDA. And, uh, and that says that they're not really interested in, in moving this product to over-the-counter status. And, 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 that's, and, and that's fascinating. I, I, uh, we could explore what are the p potential reasons why. But even though I think the takeaway is that even though there's it's a it's a very popular issue, both political parties are afraid to actually do anything about it. They would much rather at least members of Congress would much rather punt this issue to the FDA. Now, it has been the case that the FDA has tried to move contraceptives uh, to over the counter status. And the political dynamics there have been fascinating, too. We could talk about um, uh, what happened with Plan B oral contraceptives under the Obama administration. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, so let's uh, not to make this all about uh, oral contraceptives, but it, but I think that is an interesting story. Let's let's delve into that just briefly um, regarding Plan B. I think, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but I think that um, people may not be as familiar with the story or also um, how it kind of fits in with these regulations. Right. So uh, uh, when... Uh, after daily use oral contraceptives made it onto the market, uh, 
some physicians theorized and be, in uh, encouraging women to use those products in the following manner by taking a higher dose right after unprotected sex. And they found that, hey, wait a second, hey, well, you think this is preventing pregnancies? Uh, they studied, there were studies that showed that it does prevent pregnancies when you use these products in that manner after unprotected sex. And so some drug manufacturers started marketing a new product with a higher dose of, uh, of the hormones that are in the pill uh, for use uh, the morning after unprotected sex. And uh, eventually, the FDA approved this product. Uh, we call it emergency contraception or, or Plan B. And uh, initially, it was available only by prescription. But because there was such a push, and this push was coming from the left, uh, it's important to note this push was coming from the political left to remove that prescription requirement in, in, order, in order to make it easier for women to access this drug. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If this is a drug you have to take uh, within a certain uh, narrow window after having unprotected sex, it's going to be really hard to get to a physician, get an appointment, uh, get the prescription, go get it filled, and and take that product within that window. So there's a big push by the political left in order to get rid of that prescription requirement, and the safety data uh, really made the case for them. Uh, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine said that the, um, the only... Um, uh, a negative side effect, I think, was heavy heavy menses, and and that was it. And that there are lots of over the counter drugs that have much more serious side effects than that. Uh, so the FDA in about 2012, I think it was, moved to eliminate all prescription requirements on the pill. There was on on the on the morning after pill. There was. Uh, they, they chipped away at the prescription requirements, allowing over-the-counter access to, um, I think, uh, 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 women aged 17 and older, and uh, there's even some pressure by the courts for them to do so because people were filing suit. But it was in 2012, the FDA said, okay, we're, we're going to get rid of all prescription requirements. This is We're going to have unrestricted access to uh, Plan B morning after contraception. Um and uh, the Obama administration stopped the FDA from doing this. Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, Kathleen Sebelius overrode the FDA's decision. Now, this was remarkable. Why, if the if the political left was pushing, first of all, it's remarkable because it was the left, which we usually associate with more government, that was pushing to deregulate this product. Why would uh, and then uh, if that was the case? Uh, why was uh, a left of center president and his secretary of health and human services blocking that 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 step that so many in their political debate uh, their political base desired? Well, it turns out that they were afraid of a backlash from the right. They were afraid that. If President Obama, uh, on President Obama's watch, the FDA moved morning after contraception to full unrestricted over the counter status, that, uh, that, um, President Obama's Republican opponent, who it looked like would be Mitt Romney, would be able in in his 2012 re-election race would be able to say President Obama wants 12 year old girls to have sex, wants to make it easier for 12 year old girls to have sex. And so, what Secretary Sebelius said was, "There isn't. I'm stopping this, this move because there isn't enough data about whether 12 year olds can understand the labeling of uh, of, of this product." And President Obama uh, himself went in front of the cameras and said, I don't think we want this product out there next to bubble gum and batteries. And so, uh, while you had at least uh, a sizable chunk of the political left in the United States that wanted Congress to deregulate, you also had uh, a Democratic president stopping deregulation because the Republicans were even more anti-deregulation. Uh, than than he was, and uh, and he was doing it to protect his uh, or, or, or or to improve his chances for re-election, and so here do you have uh, you know women have a right to purchase this drug from any uh, manufacturer who's willing to sell it to them directly, and here you have both uh, the Republican Party and uh, uh, a sitting Democratic president denying women this right for political reasons, and that is why I I think the 
the the the uh, the poli- this, this issue, the politics surrounding this issue are fascinating, and, and they tell us a lot about the about uh, politics in the United States uh, nowadays. Uh, happily, uh, a federal court, uh, after you know m- more than a decade of trying to get full over the counter access to uh, a Plan B, uh, a federal court forced the FDA to remove all prescription requirements. And so now it is available next to bubble gum and batteries, and it's a very safe product um, uh, that, that women can access without having to go to a doctor. You know, Michael, that that story, I think, illustrates a really important point. A lot of times folks will say, well, you know, patients shouldn't be able to, you know, they, they need to have prescriptions or they need to have government approved treatments before they can take them because Patients are too biased, you know, they're um, now you, you've talked about studies that kind of show the opposite, but but people will say, well, maybe they're so desperate, they're not going to co- properly consider the risks or they're not going to properly, you know, understand the consequences um, and because they're too close to the issue of their own health. So we need somebody who's sort of unbiased and doesn't have, you know, a stake in the game to make these decisions. And this example that you just gave illustrates that there are no unbiased actors in this process. Um, and the government makes medical decisions, makes decisions about whether people can access medicines without prescriptions, especially safe and important medicines uh, based on politics sometimes. So um, I think I think it's a really important point. And there are so many examples of this sort of thing happening. So e- even even when the you know the best interests are at heart, even if we assume that most bureaucrats do have you know, purport to have people's best interests at heart. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean? There's no, you can't remove bias from, from this process. And the, uh, another thing that you'll hear is that, um, uh, slick drug industry marketing will manipulate women and other patients. Well, you know what? They have slick marketing that manipulates the politicians that make these decisions as well. Uh, we could talk about the example of, uh, naloxone. Uh, that's, that's another one, uh, and but it, it's not just that they're manipulating, uh, or or the political considerations are are uh, leading are, are manipulating the politicians who make these decisions, but the the FDA bureaucrats who, in the case of Plan B, were trying to do the right thing. Uh, even they are uh, uh, have biases that. Uh, 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 that lead them to take steps that are uh, not in the interest of patients. Uh, and we've talked about these before, which is delaying approval of uh, beneficial medications because they're afraid of, that they will look bad if that drug ends up uh, being, um, you know, having side effects that they didn't foresee. So, so you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's a question of who watches the watchmen and, um, and uh, the, there appears to be no better guarantor of patient safety here than individual freedom and letting patients make these choices themselves. Yeah, well, so I think, I mean, there's so many more um, topics and subtopics that we could delve into here, but I think you've made a really strong case for individual freedom in medicine when it comes to prescription. So what, I, I guess the last question I want to ask you is, you know, what does that world look like? So what what would happen if we really did eliminate all government mandated prescription requirements and give people the freedom to take the tr- treatments that they want to take. What, what does that look like in the United States? I think we would have much broader access to beneficial medicines, uh, at a much lower cost. And, uh, and, uh, that would improve overall health. Uh, and part of the way that it would, one of the ways that it would do that is that manufacturers would, innovate with new ways to provide patients the information they need uh, to decide whether a medicine is right for them. So that you would not have this binary of either it's over the counter and I read the label and then I'm on my own, or I go to a doctor and who knows if the advice that doctor is giving me is uh, is, is accurate and it's going to benefit me. Uh, in, uh, in the paper that I wrote with my Cato colleague and your uh, Goldwater Institute colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Singer, uh, we talk about uh, innovations like uh, kiosks that you could go to in drugstores or elsewhere that would uh, dispense medications that uh, 
uh, without a physician's prescription, but, but the, uh, that might give you a little more information and, and uh, uh, gather some information about you to see if that drug is right for you. Those kiosks could ask you about your medical history. They could ask you about other drugs that you're taking. They could even take your blood pressure and, and heart rate. Uh, and uh, or or you know you can even imagine them uh, taking your BMI and and then um, uh, asking you to sign something or, or a test that you did you understand the information they provided to you, that would be a much uh, quicker, lower cost way of providing patients access or providing patients information uh, about medications uh, that you know they might not get if they go to a physician's office uh, and at a much lower cost than, uh, than going to the physician's office. It could also help uh, protect the drug manufacturer uh, from liability because they could say, you know, if, if there were um, a, a patient who misused a product and then there was harm, the manufacturer could say, well, look, they, we dispensed it under these circumstances. They answered these questions for us. And so we did not breach our duty to that patient. We were, we were, being, we were being careful with them. Uh, this is just one of these sort of innovations that we can imagine. There are going to be others that we cannot. Uh, and, and if we get rid of the government's power to impose prescriptions, then drug manufacturers, pharmacists, pharmacies, uh, drugstore chains are going to be uh, 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 pushing to keep finding ways to give patients the medicines they need at a cost they can afford uh, with appropriate safety measures so that um, we can't el eliminate the risk uh, of taking medicines, but so that we can minimize it certainly relative to what it is today. Well, Michael, thank you so much for um, what I found to be a very fascinating discussion about an extremely important topic. And I know we've only just scratched the surface. So if folks want to learn more about um, how prescriptions interact with drug costs uh, or things like that, or a little bit more about the history of how government mandated prescriptions came to be, I highly encourage you to check out Michael and Jeff Singer's paper. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have links available to that. And thanks so much, Michael, for the discussion. And thank you to the Federalist Society. And thank, thank you. you, Christina Sandifer and Michael F. Cannon for joining us today. And thank you to our audience as well. For more content like this, please visit regproject.org. That's regproject.org. Thank you. Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 